We'll also have the second conversation that will take place um, between two of our colleagues who are representing people at the beginning of their careers or in the early career stages of the profession. Uh, and these are Katie Altieri uh, from the University of Cape Town, um, who is going to be having a conversation uh, with um, Esther Gumbi, uh, who is um, uh, currently based in the United States of America at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, and the two of them will be giving us uh, perspectives um, around this issue of, of going virtual from the perspective of people who are at a very um, kind of mid-career um, in their professions. Uh, and so that is um, the, uh, the speakers that we have for, for, for this lineup. So we're going to switch now from Phil and Isabel, who represent uh, senior people, if I can use that phrase, who run huge organizations, to now uh, having a conversation um, uh, with and between uh, Katie Atiri and Esther Gubi, uh, again representing people um, in the early stages of their careers, uh, to really give us a perspective as well on, on these aspects. So I guess my first question is going to go to, to Katie, actually. Um, um, and I know from just my interaction um, and just reading about a few things here and there, I know that you've recently attended um, a virtual conference that was um, you know, made possible because of the face-to-face -face conference didn't uh, take place. Um, I wonder if you could just uh, briefly, Katie, summarize for us uh, from that experience, uh, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of um, a virtual conference based on your experience? Katie, over to you. Thanks very much, Kelly. Thanks very much. I appreciate the question and I want to take the time to thank the Vice Chancellor for the invitation to speak today. So I, I did recently attend a virtual conference and I must say it was a really fantastic experience. It was normally a conference that's held annually in Vienna which is somewhere that from South Africa is, is far away and difficult to get to and expensive. So I was the only one from my research group attending. Um, and I appreciated a couple of things about it. The first was that I had time to prepare my presentation and prepare voiceover onto the slides. And so I could re rehearse that multiple times until I was really quite happy with it. Um, and then the second thing was the you, normally at a conference you have a talk and inevitably the time runs over. And there's no room for questions or if there is time for a question, it's one and the person is inevitably giving a comment as opposed to a question and there's really no discussion. And what I found in this case was that because all of the presentations were posted online first, that the, the chat and the text was really dynamic. And when it was time for my presentation to be discussed, it was the most engagement I've probably had over my science in a conference format and it was really outstanding. And also that every single member of my research group attended the conference throughout the week. They were online. I saw some of my um, graduate students who I would consider quite shy, young female students who probably would not have stood up in a room of 300 people to ask a question. I see them on the chat asking a question because nobody knows they're a student. Nobody knows what they look like. So I thought that was really a, a big positive. Of course, not having to travel, being able to be here with my family in Cape Town was also a positive. Um, and I would say the biggest negative of the conference is I think because those presentations were um, able to be downloaded and viewed, I had the sense that people were a little reticent to share really new and exciting research through the format because usually you give a conference presentation and it's not stored or accessible. And in this case it was and I think it led to people holding back a little bit being a little more conservative. Um, but for me, that was really the only negative. Now, I'm also someone a little bit older. You know, I, I have a full time job, so I'm not out there networking, trying to make those kinds of um, connections. And so I didn't feel personally that I missed out on that. In fact, I had two follow up Skype calls with people whom I've never met in person, um, but who were interested in uh, the research we're doing and, and that followed on from the text conversation. So I overall found it to be a really positive um, experience and and although you know there are of course shortcomings that have been mentioned but for the most part I would say it was a big plus except that I didn't get to go to Vienna which of course is a personal minus um, so with that I'll, I'll be interested to turn it back over to Esther and uh, Kelly you can take it away 
Thank you very much, uh, Katie. I'm, I'm going to ask the next question to, to Esther. Um, you know, Esther, you are currently based in uh, Chicago in the US, um, but of course we know that you're originally from, from, from Kenya. And I think you heard from what uh, Katie was, was talking about in terms of some of the, the positives of uh, the virtual conference that uh, Katie attended. So I'm just wondering, uh, from your perspective, uh, uh, somebody originally from, from Africa, from Kenya, and now based in the US. Um, so the question really is, for people that are based in African countries, why should they seize this moment to reimagine our education? And, and I guess if I can just add another part of the question is, what do you think are the unique challenges uh, that are presenting barriers to attending virtual conferences for people in Africa. Esther, over to you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, uh, the Vice Chancellor and everybody that's tuned in. Good uh, morning, afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. So we always say education is the greatest equalizer. I think uh, actually uh, coronavirus and uh, virtual conferences are now becoming the greatest equalizer. Having grown up in Kenya, started my uh, master's degree in Kenya, did everything, of course, yeah, already uh, Phil, Kate, everybody has talked about the issues, the real challenges of the cost, uh, travel issues, and of course, uh, being locked down, we know that there's already that division where uh, we think uh, researchers from the African countries are not doing a breakthrough, novel science, as we call it. So this is our time to, first of all, Seize the moment. Realize that all the walls have been opened. All the walls, literally all the walls. Now you can share with the rest of the world your research that you couldn't get to, you couldn't share in these conferences that I would say probably are reserved for the elite. Why? Because most of the time you couldn't make it to these conferences. And if you make it, probably you're looked down upon because oh, you're coming from Africa, you don't probably, you're not doing a breakthrough of the real science, as they call it, while we know science happens everywhere. Science happens in the African continent. So I think, really, I expect and I hope that uh, if you're listening to me, you're a PhD student, you're a master's student, you are a highly career like me, I'm an assistant professor, this is your time. This is your moment. And uh, as we know it, many of the conferences right now, they are at subsidized rates or even free, free. So get on it, listen to, and actually I think that also gives you an opportunity to see what's happening in the US. And then you realize, oh, actually we're thinking alike. All this research is the same. And then also see how the different methods. And so this is, I think, the time to really uh, catch up. And I think what's also, I hope after these conversations, actually now at the African continent can uh, organize one of the biggest first ever virtual conference where we actually see all the hidden research that we've never seen come out. I will attend and I promise you many, many more will attend. So yeah, I will not talk about the challenges because I think you've already laid out many of the challenges, but I think I'm taking this, this opportunity to really challenge, challenge all of us. And of course, the issue of if I start talking, then I, you know, I have an accent, but, uh, and that's a challenge to feel, how can we anonymize all these uh, challenges that always allow people to shut down when they hear another African scientist talk. So yeah, really reimagining everything that's possible now that we know we have the platform. Back to you, Kelly. Thank you, Esther, for that uh, impassionate plea. And I hope that the um, uh, fellow Africans are listening to that passionate plea uh, to really seize the moment. Um, I'm going to come back to you a little bit later, but I'm going to uh, put Katie back on the spot uh, with the next question. Um, I'm going to really frame it uh, by just making reference to what Isabel said earlier in the conversation that she had with uh, Phil. Uh, when I asked her the question around, uh, you know, if we were to go virtual, what can we not afford to lose? 
Um, so, so, so with that in mind uh, for you, Katie, what do you think we can do differently um, to ensure that we maintain best practices, um, even as we move into the virtual space, uh, given that you know, based on what Isabel mentioned earlier, there are things that we cannot afford to lose, uh, even with virtual conferences. Katie, over to you. Thanks very much, Kelly. Yeah, I think I have to echo what Esther said, which is that really we need to seize this opportunity. Um, for so long, we've accepted that on in-person conferences are the way they are. They're pretty much all the same. That model is just the way it is. They happen annually. The cities rotate, but you know there there's a definite um, mode of operating there. But I think we have the opportunity now to reimagine what is the goal of the event and how can we best achieve that goal? Sometimes the answer might be that you do have to come together in person. But I suspect that more often than not, the answer is, is not going to be that 25,000 people need to fly to a city in the middle of Europe for a week to really address the aims of a particular uh, meeting. Sometimes, perhaps if you have a, a working paper you need to get out, sure, everyone needs to be in the same room or you need to have an interview for a job, you need to meet face to face, maybe, but again, maybe not. Other than personal interaction, and Phil touched on some of the difficulties around those personal interactions um, earlier, you know, I've met very few black people, people of color, young women who have said that they miss the socializing of conferences. For the most part, that is a challenging, difficult, and sometimes even downright, um, well, very negative situation for, for young people and for women in particular. And so I think we need to think about what are the goals? What are the things that we're missing? What are, you know, what are we trying to achieve with this organization? Why are we bringing people together? And then it can be something hybrid, perhaps. You know, one year you have a virtual event where you really focus on the things that are positive about virtual events. You know, you can bring in lots and lots of people. You can have asynchronous events where you can cover multiple time zones. You can have, um, you know, one of the things with teaching at UCT, we've got some zero rated websites so that downloading um, teaching materials doesn't cost you data. We could implement that for conferences if we had the appropriate budgets. And then maybe every couple of years you have an in-person get together or a series of regional in-person get togethers to achieve what cannot be achieved through the virtual model or through other applications. So I think there's actually very little um, from the old way, quote unquote, that we're really missing. I think this is a great opportunity to, to reevaluate when we need to get together and why and do it in a, in a much more focused manner, not just because it's what's expected of you. You're expected to show up at this conference. You know, that's not a great reason to spend 24 hours on an airplane. But I think for many of us scientists, that's why we do it. Because if you don't show up, it'll be noted. And I think we're in a we're in a new normal and I'm looking forward to that. So thanks, Kelly, back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Katie. Um, I think before we get to the uh, uh, Q&A um, uh, for in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, just very briefly, Esther, you made a very, um, this is a question to you, Esther, now. You made a very impassionate plea to um, people in Africa to really seize the moment. Um, what must they do in practice? Just uh, advise them. You've made a plea to them to step up and seize the moment. Uh, just, uh, yeah, so what must they do in practice? Over to you. So yeah, thank you, yes. So once again, yeah, seize the moment. Secondly, uh, yeah, participate in three things that are out there. Get a moment to get to Harvard. You know, they, they have free, free, free uh, webinars, tune in like that, you know, as I said, just and open up and uh, and um, use this time to really also learn how to uh, do a good job with your presentation. And also let's turn the tables around. And also let's not forget the posters as well. I, I think right here we're talking about just uh, speaking. A lot of us, of course, the language barrier uh that's present so if you're going to make a poster this is the time make it show the world the african research that's been going on i, I think i just feel so excited that we are at this moment in 2020 where we can turn the tables around where we can use this uh, new normal to pivot to uh, unleash a new global university where actually uh, the greatest institutions in the African continent come alive. And the students from undergraduate to graduate levels 
really just uh, use this moment to shine through, to participate and to also build your CVs. Make no mistake, our academic conferences are important. That's where we also learn about new ideas. That's where we connect with our future employers, with your future graduate school. While COVID-19 is going to come to an end, you will need to continue to progress with your career. So use them to, to present. Just this month, I've presented over almost four, four uh, talks. And so I'm using also the moment, seizing it, and, um, and use that to connect, ask uh, your universities to bring in speakers that you never could have access to because of traveling. Ask for it, demand it, and build this knowledge. Over to you, Kelly. Thank you so much, Esther. Thank you so much. Much appreciated indeed. So I'm sure that we can really, really spend the, the entire night having this conversation. Um, but like all good things, uh, you know, come to an end. Um, so I'm just going to you know, switch uh, gear a little bit now and just entertain one or two questions for uh, Katie and, and Esther, the two of you. And um, just to get, get you, Esther, a chance to catch your breath, I'm going to start off with uh, Katie. And there's a specific question uh, that is really for Katie to, to respond to. And I'm going to read it um, as received. Here we go. How do we build rapport, trust, engagement with international collaborators, non and unknown, in international conferences? This assumes that we want to forge new collaborations and new projects. So what needs to change in online conference structures? I hope that question is clear, Katie, otherwise I can read it again. Thanks, Kelly. Um, that's very clear. Thanks for the question. So I personally found my recent experience um, to be positive in that regard and that, as I said, I was able to set up Skype conversations with people that I met via the chat. In fact, during the chat session of my um, presentation, I was I received an email from someone who already said, hey, we need to set up a call after this. And so I found that to be a positive engagement. I really think as we adjust our expectations and we get used to interacting on online platforms, it will become easier to build relationships that way. I mean, many of us do it at the beginning of these big proposals. If you're part of a, a consortium that has 20, 25 people, you're going to be really only meeting virtually for a long time and you might eventually meet that person um, face to face. But it happens. I, you know, I have collaborators, people I've even written papers with that I've never met face to face. It's just part of the science. And so I think it's in some ways it really almost comes down to a, a personality issue. There are some people who really thrive on that extroverted um, face to face social interaction and some people who really find it uh, painful and unpleasant. And so, you know, those people will have different opinions and experiences on virtual and face to face. But I think you can build up trust um, in one on one virtual conversations. If you can get it down to that when you're spending time one on one with someone, um, even virtually, I think you can build up the trust needed for, for science. So thanks, Kelly. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Katie. Um, this last question, in the interest of time, unfortunately, we have to move uh, move ahead. Uh, is actually reserved for Esther, um, uh, this question, and I'll read it for you, Esther. The question goes as follows. Does one not miss the physical excitement of meeting and networking with colleagues over a cup of tea? <laughs> Preferably a Kenyan tea. Yes, yes, of course I do miss it. I mean, I, as you can see, I'm very outgoing, so I appreciate the one-on-one. -on -one. However, but at the same time, I've gone to these meetings and realized that a lot of people of color are missing, and that makes me that cup of coffee not as enjoyable as it would be. And so I think this is the time to ensure that, yes, I can still uh, virtually connect, and at the same time, when the opportunity comes, talk over and share as much research as I can get with a cup of tea. And I think the last thing that I didn't talk about, of course, I think uh, virtual conferences open up for uh, the people with disabilities and so many, they really literally break down uh, people with a speech impairment. So this is the time to really just utilize this 
and utilize the array of tools to ensure that once again this global university taps on the intelligence of the global people including from african people so i'm excited and thank you once again vice chancellor for hosting this and i look forward to what else will come out over to you kelly thank you very much uh, esther like i said earlier unfortunately all good things come to an end um, it's been an, an absolute pleasure and a tremendous uh, honor and privilege for me to have been moderating th this session. Um, it really just remains for me to thank um, Phil, Isabel, Katie and Esther. Thank you so much for your time, uh, for your availability and for your tremendous input into this um, wonderful conversation. Uh, and of course, um, uh, tremendous thanks to our Vice Chancellor for, for hosting this event. And it's only appropriate that our Vice Chancellor open the event and I'm going to ask her to also wrap up everything else. Um, and over to you, Vice Chancellor. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, what a lively, lively discussion. Um, thank you to our panelists. Uh, uh, just a few remarks. I mean, Esther encouraged young academics to use this moment to grab opportunities, to participate, to build CVs, basically to build their careers. And, and it's interesting because uh, this is not just a call she's making. We actually found Esther through an excellent piece that she wrote for Wired magazine on science conferences being stuck in the dark ages. And that's how we got to invite her. So she's really living the advice that she's giving young people. And, and in many ways it works. So, so look at us now, a, a relationship with Esther is growing. But one of the things that, that came out of this that from the questions and discussions about how do you develop relationships of trust? And this, is, this is as a result of people grappling with the issue of what are we losing? And here's a thought that I want to drop. I mean, if you think about it, when social media came into the space, people push back. So naturally people push back to anything new. Now, Almost all the vice chancellors are on social media. Many people are getting on. Things that never used to happen there happen there. And so I keep thinking, isn't this an opportunity for us to develop new ways of developing relationships of trust? So can we talk about how do you develop a relationship of trust online rather than saying, can you actually ever do it? Maybe we should say, how do you do it? Maybe in future, in our, 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 our programs to develop young academics, we'll be actually having sessions on how do you develop a, a communities of practice online, relationships of trust online. And this is not, a, a, it's not as if it's not happening. It is happening. Those of you who follow me on social media will know about my hashtag past 3am squad. If you don't know, there's actually a group of young people who are a committee running that squad and doing a whole lot of things uh, that are working. I've never met them and uh, we meet online and it's a huge community that support one another. Postgraduate students know that they follow it and they get advice. There are many communities that develop online. So it, it, it's about how do we get we get there? So it's a big, big question. But but here's the thing, Katie talked to us about perhaps this is a time to reevaluate. When do you need face to face? When do you need online? And this lockdown has created an opportunity to see the benefits of online so it's not necessarily mean doesn't necessarily mean we won't do face to face and and the way phil was talking about how how a, a the is rethinking their conferences that they will be face to face at some stage because that need will exist but what the lockdown has created is seeing this possibility and drawing on it and so those engagements will go on and the number of face-to-face -face conferences hopefully will go down because we always have to think about our environment, the future of our planet. And of course, Isabel raised the issues that are important about who then gets excluded in this environment and how do we then challenge our, 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 our governments to make sure that there's, there's a network infrastructure to make sure that everyone can get included. So the issue of include inclusion is not now going to be individual, that you fund an individual to go to a conference. 
It may be that, well, you make infrastructure available rather than just make money, funding available to individuals. Perhaps you develop infrastructure to make sure that more people get, get access. There's been a tremendous interest and thoughtful comments coming through the question platform. And, and we, it's unfortunate that we, we have not had time to address all of them. Clearly, this is, not, this is only the start of the conversation. My hope is that we continue with the conversation. We will be writing a follow-up piece after this event, which will incorporate some of those comments that came through and the ideas that came through. But I encourage you to take these conversations into your own spaces. Write op ads um, uh, uh, almost on this issue, but also on your work, but also on your view about the future of the university in this environment. Let's not let the conversation end here. Let's continue to engage. The next webinar will focus on international collaboration, and specifically, we will explore the question how do we shift the focus? to Africa, because it's one thing to have the lockdown and say conferences are now mostly and are attended by a wider, diverse group of people. But we need to be asking, what are the voices that are shaping the academy? How are they shaping the academy? And how does this new way of engaging privilege or create possibilities for voices from, from the global south but also from Africa, in particular, voices that have been that have been silenced. I hope you join us for the next webinar. Thank you so much, wherever you are in the world. We really appreciate your engagement. Continue to engage, and we'll see you in our next uh, webinar. Just follow us, hashtag Global Uni. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, for doing fantastic work chairing this session.